Selston uh, or further afield. So exciting. I love this moment. Uh, six more sleeps and uh, Jesus is coming. Of course he's coming because God is so faithful and keeps all of his promises. Waiting just a bit longer but he's within touching distance now. Isn't it so exciting? So we pray that you will be blessed, inspired and encouraged as we join together and uh, worship our great God. This carol service is just going to flow through seamlessly, uh, we hope. So all of the readings uh, will be unannounced, as will the carols. And uh, as our singers stand uh, to sing at the front, uh, please feel free to join with them and all of the words will be projected. So welcome again, and let's worship God together, once in Royal David City.
who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Therefore, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labour gives birth, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. reading is taken from Luke 1 26 to 38 in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth a town in Galilee to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph a descendant of David the virgin's name was Mary the angel went to her and said greetings you who are highly favored the Lord is with you. 
Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favour with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she, and who was said to be unable to conceive, is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Mary's song of praise. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the ear country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greetings reaches my ear, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord will fulfill his promise to her. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, 
for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. Our next reading is taken from the book of Luke, chapter 2, 1 to 7. It says, In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went to his own town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in a cloth and placed him in a manger, 
because there was no guest room available for them. birth of Jesus in Luke's account, beginning at verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You'll find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. 
So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. community and of our world so we pray and gracious God as we come to pray we uh, think again of that invitation to worship what a wonderful story this is how incredible 
you come towards us. You don't leave us on our own. You make a move towards us. You come lowly and humble in that manger as that uh, little one, that little baby breaks the sound of silence with the loud cry of a newborn inhaling air and uh, its lungs filling up and screaming out, it is your arrival in our world. You come to save us. How thankful we are. We join with the angels. We think of them singing of peace on earth and how thankful we are for their arrival and what they proclaim. And yet, Lord, how we long to see that peace made real in our world and in our lives now. That peace, that shalom, that kind of all-embracing, uh, everything changing, all-renewing peace, which only you can bring. We think, Jesus, of how your word speaks of your arrival. Uh, the words of your gospel writer, John, said that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness hasn't overcome it. And as we pray now for ourselves and for our world, this would just be our prayer that in maybe things that we are finding hard, situations that we're experiencing as, uh, as a darkness, things that are troubling us, making us anxious, making us fearful, that we would just feel your light breaking in. Even if tonight it's just a, a crack that lets in a glimmer of light, that your light would come in and change and transform uh, that which is dark. We've come before you now and we recognize that there are going to be some among us. There are people in our church family who we know for whom this, this feels like a season of loss. It is a season of loss. It's lost because we grieve, because we are missing someone dear to us. It's, it's a loss which we're very aware of at this time of year because uh, we know that Christmas is coming and there's going to be someone not with us at uh, the mealtime this Christmas day because they've gone, because illness took them from us. Perhaps a relationship has changed and that breakup has taken them from us. Someone has moved away and uh, will not be close in the same way. And all of this change is something we experience as a loss. Thank you that you say that you will come to be with us. May we know your presence in the absence of people who we wish were with us. May we know your healing and your comfort in moments when we feel anxious, perhaps as some of us right now, are experiencing illness, are waiting for a hospital appointment, are waiting for test results. And we pray for this particularly because we're mindful that this feels, if we're honest, like a particularly dark winter because of COVID, because of this pandemic. Sometimes we feel like we move two steps forward and then something comes along, Omicron comes along, and it seems to pull us back, back to a place we were before, and we, we don't want to be in that place again. Oh, loving God, we just pray, we cry out to you for protection for ourselves and our loved ones, protection for all people. We pray most of all for an end to this pandemic. We cry out and we say, how long, oh Lord? We pray that it would come to an end soon. We don't want to live in a world where we are fearful of the virus. We don't want to live in a world where we have to wear masks, where we can't hug, where we have to keep a distance. I think, Jesus, of how uh, you came along and you touched people who were sick. There was a power that you had that was able to overcome fear and it made people who were unwell healed again and whole. God, in your power, would you move in our world? so that we can touch one another again and not be fearful. And we pray as we ask for all these things, particularly at the moment for people impacted right now by the pandemic, for people in hospital, for people who are ill, for those who are looking uh, after them and working so hard and are so tired. We thank you for the NHS. We're so grateful for it. We thank you for every key worker and we pray for protection upon them, for the people who work 
to drive ambulances, who work in hospital wards, who are working to keep our shelves stocked, who are working to police very complex and very difficult regulations. Be near to all of them, we pray. We pray for vaccine staff. We pray for people who even right now are going to be giving jabs and uh, implementing booster programs. And as we pray for this, we want to pray in particular for vaccines to be delivered all across our world in a fair and a just way. We pray that no one in our world would go wanting for the vaccines that they need and that they desire. And uh, we hear of some places where maybe only 5% of people uh, have been able to have vaccines in some countries. I read about that a few weeks ago. This is wrong. So God of justice, we pray that this would be put right. And finally, as we, we pray for uh, our world, we pray a little bit closer to home for our country. And uh, we realize that maybe things feel darker this winter as well, because whatever our views, none of us can deny that our politics feel chaotic. They feel uh, disordered. There is so much disagreement and so many important issues, like how to lead in the pandemic, like uh, what's going to happen about Brexit and Ireland, where there is no agreement, where there seem to be voices becoming angrier and no prospect of people backing down. We pray again for the peace on earth that the angels promised and peace in our own country, peace in our society. All these prayers we pray to you, loving God, God of light, God who has promised that your light will overcome. And we pray them in confidence. Amen. The next reading is from Matthew 2, verses 1 to 12, 
visitors from the east. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chiefs, priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, and for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Our next reading is John 3, 16 to 21. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. 
For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds may be exposed. Whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Good evening, church. Are we still awake? Still alive? Okay, that's all right. <clears throat> I just want to say I've got a little sore throat, so I've got a bit of a cough. It's not COVID. I've been tested, so you don't need to worry if I cough along. Um, but I just want to share just a short reflection. Um, it's, it's good to, to be here today, to be able to actually physically see each other and share uh, with you all this evening. <clears throat> but um, I'm not going to share from one particular passage. There's a few passages that I want to touch on um, today. And I want to ask you all a question. It's a question that I've been thinking about during this Christmas season. It's a very important question. I think it's a question that both Christians and non-Christians need to consider at least five times in your life. You need to ask yourself this question, especially during this Christmas period. And it's a question that I recognize that a lot of young people, young adults, are asking this question today in many different ways. And the reason why I was thinking about this question, I'm going to tell you what the question is in a moment, don't worry. But the reason why I was thinking about this question um, over this Christmas period, because we recognize that for hundreds of years, the church has been putting on different Christmas services. We've had many carol services. Some people here have probably been to 100 carol services. Who knows? But there's been many Christmas carol services that the church will put on all around the world, many different services. From November, we know as ministers that we, you know, we start panicking. We want to make sure that everything is ready for Christmas and all the different things that come in celebrating Christmas. We just know it's something that we have to do. And of course, Christmas is meant to be this time where we remember the birth of Jesus, where Christians come together and we remember the birth of Jesus. And we, of course, know that there's other stuff that's been added into this Christmas story. But for Christians, we know that we come together to remember the birth of Jesus. Amen? Amen. I always do that just to make sure people are awake. But, but we do this. We come and we remember the birth of Jesus. But this is Jesus who lived and walked on the earth more than 2,000 years ago. He walked on the earth more than 2,000 years ago in a time that was very different to our time and in a culture that was very different to our culture, but still over 2,000 years, still there are Christians who still talk about Jesus, who worship Jesus, who come to church and sing songs about Jesus, read scriptures about Jesus, write books about Jesus every single year. There are hundreds of books that are written about Jesus. So my question is, is Jesus still relevant today? Is Jesus still relevant today? A question I want you to think about. It might be a very easy question for you to answer. Or maybe it might be a very hard question for you to answer. Is Jesus still relevant today? And the reason why I'm asking this question is because we will all recognize that actually we live in a fast-paced world. Things are changing constantly, and actually there are things that are no longer relevant. Things become no longer relevant in this fast-changing world that we live in. And sometimes society has a big influence about what is relevant and what is not relevant. So we see that trends come and go. And maybe there is something in your generation growing up that you remember so well that was so important, so relevant in your generation, but then you realize that maybe your children and your grandchildren have no idea what these important things were to you. I remember speaking to my nephew a few, a few weeks ago about a movie that I love. I have two really <laughs> movie, well, movies that I love. One of them I can't say because of my street cred. It might go a bit down if I tell you what this movie is. Some of you know already. But I was speaking about one of the, the biggest movies that came out personally in my lifetime was um, Home Alone. 
Home Alone's a fantastic movie. Everyone, hopefully, has watched the, the movie Home Alone. But my nephew have, has never seen the movie Home Alone. And I was shocked. Like, this, this movie was huge. And maybe there's other stuff that we recognized that was so big in our time and is no longer relevant today. I remember me and Jemima were speaking recently about a, an amazing show. Was it Sounds of Music? Um, I've never heard of it in my life. I've never heard of it in my life. And there are certain times me and Trevor are speaking, and Trevor mentioned something that he used to do or watch back in the day. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> but we see it, trends come and go. We see this with clothing. Why is it that we don't wear the same clothes as people who lived 150 years ago? Because it's no longer in fashion, no longer a day. And it would be kind of weird if we saw someone wearing something that was um, worn 150 years ago. And I think maybe for younger people, there is a bit more of a concern about what they wear. They want to make sure that everything that they're wearing is in fashion. And if you go and buy your teenager some trainers that is no longer in date, you're going to be in trouble. But well, we do this with clothing. We see this with clothing. And we see this with technology. Goodness me, we see how technology has evolved over the years. Maybe some of you here were alive when the first phone was ever made. Who knows? But we see how technology changes. I remember when the first iPhone, thank you for that laugh there. I, I remember when the first iPhone came out. For me, that was huge. When the first iPhone came out, big, it was amazing. Who talks about the first iPhone anymore? We have so many um, far more advanced iPhones that we have. The point I'm trying to make is that there are things that are relevant and there are things that are no longer relevant. And maybe they used to be so important to you, something that you couldn't live without, but now they're no longer relevant. And see, if there's something that isn't relevant to us anymore, we're never really going to engage with it. There's not going to be any use, no, any value to those things anymore. And that's why I want to ask us this question, is Jesus still relevant today? You see, I guarantee you, if any of you here still have a, a VCR player that you used constantly, even today, what I think it's a tape player or tape recorder, I'm not sure what they're called, but if you still use or still have a VCR player, people will ask you why. Why do you still use something that is so out of date? Why do you still use it today? And I believe people will ask you that same question about Jesus. Why do you still worship Jesus? Why do you still go to church and listen to sermons and talks about Jesus even today? What would your answer be if someone asks you that question? Is Jesus relevant today? The reason why this question is important for Christians and non-Christians is because this question really changes everything about us. You see, if you don't believe in Jesus and you suddenly come to the realization that actually Jesus is relevant for today, then everything begins to change for you. Trevor mentioned this morning how Jesus just changes the course of history. Jesus changes our lives. So if suddenly we realize that actually Jesus is relevant for today, then things will begin to change for you as you begin to engage with Jesus. And in the same way, if you're a Christian and you suddenly realize that actually Jesus is no longer relevant for today, then things will begin to change for you as well. And there are some people who come to that conclusion. But today, all I want to do is share this short reflection why I believe Jesus is still relevant today. Jesus is still relevant today. And it seems like year by year, there seems to be more of a need for Jesus. There is more and more of Jesus that we need in our world today. And I want to share just four reasons why I believe that Jesus is relevant today. I had 50 things that I wrote down. But I'm not going to share all those 50 things today. I'm just going to share four reasons why I believe that Jesus is relevant. And I really pray that we can really reflect on these four reasons. Maybe if you have a pen and paper or a phone or whatever, you can write these four things down and just reflect on it over this Christmas period. I think it's so easy for us to come and hear a lovely, amazing Christmas carol and watch a nativity plays and, and have this whole great Christmas service talking about Jesus, reading scriptures about Jesus, but still don't really see how Jesus is relevant for us in our lives and relevant in our world. So I want us to really understand this today. Are you still with me? Yeah. Awesome. So the first reason why I believe that Jesus is still relevant today is because 
He's still the only Savior of the world. The reason why Jesus is still relevant today is because he's still the only Savior of the world. You see, the reason why certain things become irrelevant is because something far more better, far more powerful comes and takes over. I spoke about the iPhone. Why is it that we don't rush and talk about the first iPhone anymore? It's because we recognize there's been 13 far more powerful advanced iPhones than the iPhone 1. Why is it that we don't talk about a softball power anymore? Some people have no idea who a softball power is. He won the 100 meters, or he broke the world record in 2007 in 100 meters. Why is it that we don't talk about him anymore? Why don't we celebrate him anymore? It's because we recognize that Usain Bolt has come and has completely smashed that record. So we don't celebrate a soft power anymore, but we, we recognize Usain Bolt who has come and he smashed the world record. Someone better has come. But you see, that's not the same with Jesus. There is no one better who has come after Jesus. There is no other savior who has come after Jesus. There's no other person who's able to do the work that Jesus did on the cross by saving us from our sins. There's no other greater person who has come after Jesus. No other greater person that's been able to remove our sin that was pushing us further and further away from God. Only Jesus was able to accomplish this big task. And so we read in the Old Testament some amazing prophecies about Jesus and what Jesus will come and do for his people. And you see, the people in those days listening to those prophecies, they understood that they needed a savior. They understood how messed up they were. They understood how messed up their situation were, how messed up the world was. So they knew they needed a savior, but not just any savior. They knew that their savior had to be greater than their greatest leader because their greatest leader needed a savior. The greatest savior needed saving. And this is still the case today. We still need saving. This world still needs saving. Unfortunately, the most powerful men and women in our world today, they can't save you from your sins because they need saving too. The government, as powerful as they are, they can't save you from your sins because they need saving too. Our family members, as great as they are and how loving they are, they can't save you from your sins because they need saving too. Only Jesus Christ can save us from our sins. Only Jesus Christ can save us from this broken world that we're living in. And this is why someone like Peter, when he's preaching to the people in the early church in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, he says, look, salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. The reason why Jesus is still relevant today is because he's still the only savior of the world. He's still the only one that can save you. Save you from the things that are holding you back from experiencing all that God wants you to experience. He's still the only one that can save you from the, the sins that we commit that push us further and further away from God. He's still the only one that can save us from a life of unhappiness that we experience living in this world. This is why I believe that Jesus is still relevant today. The second reason, are we still with me? Cool, a few people are there. The second reason why Jesus is still relevant today is because he's still changing lives today. The reason why Jesus is still relevant today is because he's still changing lives today. You see, it's very easy for us to pick up the Bible and read the Gospels and look at how Jesus changed someone's life. And we see Jesus often does that in the New Testament. And it's you know, beautiful to read how Jesus heals a, a lame person, a person with leprosy, a person who is blind, and their lives are completely changed with this encounter with Jesus. But then we can fold up the Bible and think, that was a really good story. That was really good. But the thing is, Jesus wasn't just changing lives 2,000 years ago. Jesus is still changing lives today. In fact, one of the reasons why so many people are here today is because your life has been impacted by Jesus. Your life has been changed by Jesus. And if if this is not true for anyone in this room today, I know this is true for me. I know I will not be standing here if it wasn't 
for Jesus coming in and changing my life. I know exactly where I was heading if Jesus did not come and impact my life. Many of us could see where our life was heading if Jesus did not come and step in. Jesus is still changing lives today. What we were before is not the same person we are now because when Jesus comes, he begins to take all the things that just don't glorify God and he puts more of himself in us. And that's why Paul, he's very bold when he says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, he says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In the same way, Paul writes to the church in Corinth and he says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, all things have become new. There is something powerful that happens to us when we have this encounter with Jesus. He does his work in our lives. And you see, there is a need for us to be changed. Or maybe I'm in a church where everyone is perfect. No one's ever sinned. There's clearly a need for Jesus to do his work, his saving work in our lives. There is a need for Jesus to take our bitterness and turn it into joy. There is a need for Jesus to take our anger and turn it into gentleness. There is a need for Jesus to take our hate and turn it into love. There is a need for Jesus to work in our lives. And one of the clear ways that Jesus works throughout the New Testament is through miracles. He actually does miracles. And you see, if Jesus was only doing miracles 2,000 years ago, and not doing miracles today, I could see why people would say he's not relevant today. But Jesus is doing miracles today. And one of the most powerful miracles that Jesus is doing in our world is how he changes us. How he takes all our mess and turns it into light. What a miracle it is how Jesus transforms our lives. Jesus is relevant today because he changes lives. The third reason, we're almost there. The third reason why Jesus is still so relevant today is because his words and his teachings are alive and active. Because his words and his teachings are alive and active. Do you ever read some of Jesus' words and just marvel? Or is it just me or anyone else? You just read his words and read his teachings and like, wow, how amazing. And how is it that his teachings, which he taught more than 2,000 years ago, can be so relevant for us today? It's because his words and his teachings are timeless. You just have to marvel at at his words. I've I've come across people who don't believe in Jesus, but they love his teachings. They love his words, but they just don't love Jesus. See, Jesus' words and his teachings are so relevant for us today. His words of hope, how we need his words of hope for us today in this world that is so broken Jesus says in John 10, 10, he says, The thief comes only to kill, steal, and destroy, but I have come so that you may have life and have it to the full. This is the hope that we have in Jesus. We can live life to the full. His words of comfort is needed today. I need his words of comfort daily. And Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, he says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life what you will eat or what you will drink, about your body, what you will wear. Is not your life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they are? Can any one of you worry about, worry, add a single hour to your life? He gives words of comfort. His words of truth. See, Jesus' words are not just amazing, but they're they're true. And often Jesus would say, before he makes a big statement, he says, truly, truly, I say to you. I believe he's saying this because what he's about to say is truth because he is truth. See, unfortunately, truth is not guaranteed in our world today. I don't need to go into details about all of that, but truth is not guaranteed in our world today. Sometimes even the people we love don't always tell us the truth. But truth is always 100% in Christ. You will always find truth in Jesus. His words of direction, 
Jesus teaches people how to live a life in a world that is so broken, in a world where people oppress each other, in a world of so much injustice. He shows us how to live different, to love our neighbors. He goes further and says, look, love your enemies. These are words that we need to hear today. The reason why Jesus is still so relevant is because these words and these teachings are alive and active today. And lastly, and this is a very important point, the reason why Jesus is still so relevant today is because he's still the only way to God the Father. Because he's still the only way to God the Father. See, I speak to a lot of people, and there are some people who are okay to come to the point where they understand that actually the idea of a God, a higher being, is relevant for us today. So they're happy to accept the concept of a God, a higher power, is relevant today, but they just don't believe that Jesus is relevant today. But the problem with that is that Jesus is the only way to God the Father. And he makes it clear in John 14, verse 6, Jesus answers and he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Amen? So the only way that human beings can connect with God is through Jesus. There is no other way. There are not many ways to Jesus. There's not many ways to God. There's only one way, and that's through Jesus. There is no shortcuts or secret passages or secret hiding places to get to God. It's only through Jesus. And the reason why this is so important is because we understand that knowing God doesn't just affect our life here, but it affects our lives for eternity. So if Jesus is still the only way to God, that means Jesus is the only way to eternal life. And Jesus makes it clear. Jemima read it to us today. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And in the same way, in John chapter 3, verse 36, it says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains in him. The only way to God is through Jesus. There's not so many ways, there's only one way. So Jesus is relevant for us today because he connects us to God in a way that we can't do ourselves. Unholy people can't connect with a holy God. So what Jesus does, he comes and he lives in us. So when God sees us, he sees Jesus who is holy living inside of us. The reason why Jesus is so relevant today is because he connects us to God. He's still the only way to God. Now in conclusion, I know I said a lot this uh, evening, but I want to encourage us to just pause during this Christmas period And think about why is Jesus so relevant today? Is Jesus still so relevant today? And maybe for some of you, this is a hard question to answer because of the hardship that you faced during this difficult time. And you're struggling to see how Jesus is relevant in your life or struggling to see how Jesus is relevant in this world. Or maybe actually things are going really well for you. Everything seems to be going really well for you, so you don't really see the need for Jesus. You've already done everything for yourself. And you can recognize, actually, yeah, that person needs Jesus, but maybe you don't see that actually you need Jesus. Everybody needs Jesus. And I want to remind us that the reason why we need Jesus is because he's still the Savior of the world, still the only Savior of the world, because he's still changing lives today, because he still speaks truth, And because he's still the only way to God the Father. So whether you're going through a challenging time or or whether everything's going really well for you, every human being falls under these categories. Every human being needs a savior. Every human needs their lives changed. Every human needs the truth. And every human needs more of God. And I also want to encourage those who don't yet believe in Jesus whoever you may be today. And maybe today you've kind of seen just in four ways how Jesus is still relevant for, in our lives today. And the great thing about Jesus is that Jesus knows that we need him. And anytime you ask him into your life, he will come and he will do that life-changing work that he's doing for so many people. So this Christmas period, my prayer is that we all see the need for more of Jesus, who is our Savior, 
who's the one that changes lives, who's the one that speaks truth, and who's the one who's the only way to the Father. Amen. just want to say thank you again for joining us and I want to say a huge thank you to lots of people who've worked incredibly hard to make this happen so much effort goes into an evening like tonight so massive thank you to our musicians uh, and singers and to the tech team uh, who have made all of this happen uh, so seamlessly uh, as well for those of us here and watching on and to people who've been working really hard on the refreshments that we can share now we even have hot chocolate and squirty cream oh it is christmas um we also have just a couple of services coming up uh, in the next couple of days We've got our longest night service on tuesday evening six o'clock it's going to be very quiet very meditative uh, and just a safe space, we hope, because Christmas is hard, we realise, for some of us. And uh, a more family service uh, on Christingle, four o'clock on Christmas Eve, and then back here, Christmas Day at half past ten. be great to see you then. Can I finish by just praying a blessing for you? I pray God's blessing on you in all the days to come, the sleeps between now and Christmas as well, and all those that lie beyond. And as you follow the star, may it lead you to the same place that the shepherds and wise men arrived at. The place of wonder where heaven meets earth in a newborn baby. The place of praise as you join with the angels in speaking of God's glory and peace on earth. And the place of welcome. May the Jesus once held in Mary's arms become to you the one who holds you in his embrace. Amen.